Mother Teresa was born Agnes Boyachu in Macedonia on August 26, 1910. Her family was Albanian, and at the age of 12, she felt the call of God strongly on her heart, and she knew that she was going to be a missionary and spread the love of Jesus Christ. At the age of 18, she left her parents' home, and she joined the Sisters of Loreto, which is an Irish community of nuns that have missions into India. After a year's training in Dublin, she went to India, where on May 24th, 1931, she took her vows to be a nun. And then for 17 years, Mother Teresa taught at St. Mary's High School in Calcutta. But it was the suffering and poverty that she saw outside the school walls that made such a deep impression on her that in 1948, she received permission from her superiors to leave the school and devote herself to working amongst the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta. She had no funds, so she depended entirely on charity, and she started an open-air school for poor children. Soon, she was joined by voluntary helpers and financial support, started pouring in, and this made it possible for her to extend the scope of her mission. On October 7th, 1950, Mother Teresa received permission to start her own order, which was the Missionaries of Charity, whose primary task was to love and care for the people that she was already looking after. And then in 1965, the society became an international religious family by decree of Pope Paul VI, and that prompted Mother Teresa to begin expanding her scope internationally. And by 1997, the Missionaries of Charity numbered more than 4,000, in addition to thousands more lay volunteers with 610 foundations in 123 countries around the world. And after several years of declining health, including heart, lung, and kidney problems, Mother Teresa died on September 5, 5th, 1997, and she was 87. Mother Teresa once said, we are all pencils in the hand of a writing God who was sending love letters into the world. Mother Teresa chose as her life to serve and not to be served. She wanted to live like Jesus, to minister and to care for the poorest of the poor. Jesus says in Mark 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, those are very good words. Very good words and popular words. You might have heard that verse before, but the bigger question is, why did Jesus say it? What brought that up? Why did Jesus say those words? Well, the context here is the disciples, James and John. They had asked Jesus if they could sit on his right and his left in the future kingdom of God. And this was Jesus's reply to everyone listening. Mark 10, 35, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became to be indignant, and James and John. And Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. James and John think that recognition is in a place, a place of honor. It's in a seat, seated in the chair, right? I want my name in lights. I want my name first in the credits. I want my name in the program, and I want it in bold. I want to be seen. I want to be thanked. I want to be recognized. But Jesus said, no, you have it all backwards. 
The one who stands tallest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who is on their knees. The one who recognizes their own humility. The one who considers others better than themselves. The one who seeks to serve, not to be served. This is the one who looks and loves and lives like Jesus. You see, at this juncture in the disciples' lives, they still haven't gotten it. They had seen Jesus heal and teach, and they've witnessed miracles firsthand, and they were proud to be following in the footsteps of their rabbi, but they hadn't made the shift yet from hearing his teaching to living his teaching and to become the person that Jesus was teaching about. They were like uh, two shipwrecked men in a lifeboat. They're at the other end of the boat, and they're watching the people at that end bail the boat frantically, taking water out of the boat just to keep them afloat. And the guys at the other end, one says to the other, thank goodness the hole is down at that end. Perspective, right? When things have to get done, it's easy to say, oh, that's somebody else's problem. That's somebody else's job. But today's shift in our pursuit of living our best life, begs each person to ask the question, what is my job? What is my role? And am I doing it? Jesus said in John 12, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So I want you to picture a church, okay? Picture a church in which everyone wants to be served. Each person believes the church exists to meet their needs, to make them happy, to cater to their whims and their tastes. Imagine a congregation in which everyone's mindset is, take care of me. They have that attitude. And then if they're not being taken care of, they're quick to complain, that they're not satisfied. Now, sadly, some people don't have to imagine a church like that because they attend a church like that. That kind of church will never have a positive impact on the world. It'll grow small. It'll turn inward. It'll become unhealthy. That kind of church does not honor Jesus and it does not bring glory to God. And that church isn't governed by the Holy Spirit. Now, imagine a church in which every single person has the passion to serve another person. Think about what God could do through a group of people who are committed to ministry to the point of sacrifice, sacrificial ministry to one another. These people know that the Holy Spirit has given them gifts, given them some sort of a unique ability, and that that gift is used to build up the kingdom, to glorify God. And so they are purposeful about discovering their gift and then developing that gift and using it. What could God do through a church like that? You know, someone once said, God does not ask for your ability or your inability. He asks only for your availability. You know, you're either on the stretcher or you're carrying it. There are times we need to be served. It's true. But the bottom line is that God wants each of us to carry someone in their time of need. The church was never meant to be a bunch of people who just came and watched a few exhausted people who were carrying the burden of the entire congregation. A church filled with people who serve could change the world. Romans 1 says, God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you. Galatians 5 says, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. 1 Timothy 3 says, those who have served well again, an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. When you get to heaven, God is not going to look for your medals or your degrees, or the diplomas that you hang on your wall, God is going to look for 
your bruised knees and elbows, the scratches in your hand from your years of service. So, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, Jesus has gifted each Christian to serve. That's the good news. Jesus has gifted each Christian to serve, which means Jesus doesn't just ask you to serve and then push you out in front. No, he equips you. He equips you. He puts a shovel in your hand. He gives you the hammer. He gives you the tools and the talents that you need. Can I show you something? I want to show you something. This is a picture from 10 years ago. This is Ronnie Hawkins, and he is helping out with kids. This was a lock-in that we did for the kids. It was a date night that we did for the community, which means we had something like 30 kids uh, running around in the Family Life Center, making noise, causing commotion, of course. And Ronnie Hawkins didn't say, you know, I'm not good with kids. So, I mean, what, what could I do? Instead, Ronnie said, I know how to do yo-yo tricks. And he came and he showed the kids some yo-yo tricks for 20 minutes. And today, uh, you would not even have donuts in church without Ronnie because he drives out every Sunday to get them. Now, is Ronnie a staff member? No. Does the church pay him? No. Is he a board member? No. He just serves. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul says that Jesus has gifted each one with his grace. Now, we tend to think of grace as being pardon and forgiveness, but the grace that Paul is talking about here is not saving grace, but rather what we would call equipping grace, the grace that enables us to exercise and act upon our spiritual gifts. And Paul has used the word grace like this in other parts of the Bible. He says in Ephesians 3, 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Jesus has gifted Paul with the ability to use his spiritual gifts, the purpose of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul says that that ability to preach is grace. Now, we've had two gentlemen, Kelly and Jerry, both preach for me this year. You know, uh, when I, I took the Sunday off, uh, and you might be thinking, well, I haven't been blessed with the grace of preaching. That's fine. But every single disciple of Jesus has been gifted with a spiritual gift and the grace to put those gifts to work. Romans 12 says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. 1 Corinthians 12 says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And then lastly, 1 Peter 4 says, as each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So the fact is, if you are a disciple of Jesus, right, he has gifted you with at least one spiritual gift. And the purpose of this gift is not to benefit you personally, but rather to benefit the entire body of his church. Number two, Jesus has gifted the church leaders to go out in front. Jesus has gifted church leaders to go out in front. We see uh, this in Ephesians verse 11, chapter 4. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So this means not only do we have individual members of the church who have gifts and abilities, but within that same body, God calls men and women to be out in front and to lead the church. I know it might look like, you know, because I stand on stage, that I'm, I'm the leader of, of everything. But at Walden Community Church, we are a board-driven church, which means we have about 12 men and women who meet once a month and they discuss how the money is used and how we can better impact our community. 
And if you're thinking, oh, I can do that, I, I should volunteer for that, just know that the only way to get on the board is to be nominated. Which means, in order to take the highest role in the church, you already need to be serving in some other capacity. You're already leading, even though nobody pinned a name tag on you, and someone else notices you acting like an apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, or a teacher, and then they nominate you for leadership. In January, we'll be looking for more men and women to take those leadership roles. Have you seen someone model that kind of grace? Now is a good time. Grab your connection card. Nominate someone. What is that role? What is that role of a church leader? Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to, here it comes, equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. This is why at Walden Church we say, Every member is a minister. Every member is a minister. That word equip in verse 12, that's the Greek word that means to set a broken bone, to put something back together, to fix something. It's the idea that it's broken and now you're filling in all the parts that are missing. It's the same word that Matthew uses when Jesus sees James and John doing something to their nets. Matthew 4.21 says, And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. So here, James and John are equipping their nets. They were mending holes. They were removing tangles. There's objects from the lake inside there that are stuck inside the fibers of the net. And they're fixing what is broken and they are filling in what is lacking. So the role of leadership is to help mend what is broken and supply what is missing. And you do that with your gifts. In the church, the goal is to help each person develop their spiritual gifts so that that church worker best puts themselves to work. And as Jesus equips the church, the body grows. As Jesus equips the church, the body grows. Now, lately, we've all noticed that across America, church attendance is down by 50%. Before COVID, we had 100 or so people in first service, and now we're looking at 50. We had 80 or so in second service, and now we're about 40, which means between both services, we're missing about 90 people. Now, it'd be really easy to ask, what is the board going to do about this? What is Pastor David going to do about this? I sure hope we hire a children's pastor soon so that we can fix this problem. But this is on all of us. I mean, last week we had a potluck. Now, Valerie and I, we set up all the tables and chairs. But after the potluck, 10 people helped put the tables and chairs away. Now you tell me, what do you think? Which one was faster? Two people or 10? English poet John Haywood said, many hands make light work, right? Now I could get on the phone and I could call 90 people or each one of you could call one person. Each one of you could invite one person, a neighbor or a friend back to church. Your staff could work 24-7 around the clock and never punch out. Or you could volunteer to show kids yo-yo tricks for 20 minutes. Don't you see, if push comes to shove, we wouldn't need to hire anyone to fill in the gaps because the Bible promises that we already have everything that we need. Because we're talented? Because we're skilled? Because we're great? No. Because we have God, and this is his church. We won't succeed by our own merits. You and I, we can't build this church. That is 100% the job of Jesus. 
How do I know? Because Jesus told me. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's his church. He can build it. So let's go back to Ephesians again. This is Ephesians 4, verses 15, 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Again, who makes the body grow? Jesus, written by Paul, who is a pastor, who planted 14 some odd churches. And notice that it's a partnership, right? It's not all on Jesus and it's not all on us. Verse 16 says that it happens when each part is working properly. The church works best when every member works. The church works best when every member works. The disciples walk in waiting for Passover dinner. And surprisingly, there is no paid servant at the door to greet them uh, or to have a water basin and a towel and to wash their feet. They're all tired from a long journey and they file in single file, they hug and they sit down at the table and about halfway through the meal, it gets really weird. John 13, so he, Jesus, got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. You see, Jesus wasn't just a person who modeled leadership. He was also a person who modeled servanthood. Nobody that night was willing to serve. Nobody that night was willing to become the least in the room. So instead, the one who was the greatest got down on his hands and knees. And it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone because this is the same man who said, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. See, the true servant places their needs last. As Jesus exemplifies in his life and in his death. And being a servant doesn't even mean taking a servant type position. Instead, it means having an attitude in life that attends to the needs of others without expecting or demanding anything in return. I don't need to sit at your left or right. I don't need my name in the bulletin or up on lights. I don't need recognition or, or pats in the back. Servant leaders realize that they are not above any job. Seeking honor, respect, and the attention of others, that runs contrary to Jesus's instructions for his servants. But Jesus models leadership but he models it from a different perspective, a perspective of service. And he calls each of us to do the same. I wanna close with a poem. It says, I saw Jesus last week. He was wearing blue jeans and an old shirt. He was up at the church building. He was alone and working hard. And for just a minute, he looked a little like one of our members, but it was Jesus. I could tell by his smile. I saw Jesus last Sunday. He was teaching a Bible class. He didn't talk real loud or use long words, but you could tell he believed what he said. And for just a minute, he looked like my Sunday school teacher, but it was Jesus. I could tell by his loving voice. I saw Jesus yesterday. He was at the hospital visiting a friend who was sick. They prayed together quietly, and for just a minute, he looked like Brother Jones but it was Jesus. I could tell by the tear in his eye. I saw Jesus this morning. He was in my kitchen making my breakfast and fixing me a special lunch. And for just a minute, he looked like my mom, but it was Jesus. I could tell by the love that was in his heart. I see Jesus everywhere, taking food to the sick, welcoming others to his home, being friendly to a newcomer. And for just a minute, 
I think he's someone that I know, but it always is Jesus. I can tell by the way that he serves. May someone see Jesus in you today. Let's pray together. Lord, we do want to live our very best life. And as the world teaches us one way to live and shows us one example, Lord, you show us another. May we shut out this negative voice of the world, this world that tells us that life is one way, that these are the things that are important when they're not. We are focusing our lives on the things that don't matter. Lord, this world is about eternity and about making more Christians and better Christians. And you have called each one here to be both sheep and shepherd, to be a leader, to evangelize, and to serve. Lord, may each one here unite with your kingdom purpose to seek and to save the lost, so that one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. May this be a church where every member serves, a church that seeks to change its community, change its world, and we can do it all because you equip, you give grace, you love, you forgive, you strengthen, you give power, and you grow. Lord, grow your church. As churches all across America and all across the world are experiencing a decline, as we see attendance drop in churches all over the United States, Lord, we just pray for resurgence. We pray for revival. We pray as Christmas approaches that people return. They once again seek the baby. They once again seek the manger and the beautiful gift that Christmas is. Lord, fill these churches this Christmas with seekers, with people that are looking for answers, but not just answers, truth. Our world is a lie. And the facts and the television and the emails we send, they're lies. Because it's only about you. This world is only about you because it's yours. It's your world. May we put our energy into serving you and serving your church so that your kingdom comes and that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. Uh, thanks for watching. Of course, I do want to remind you that we do have church here presently, physically, and we miss you, and we would love to have you return. Uh, we have two services every morning, one at 9.30, which is our traditional service, and we have a choir. We have an 11 o'clock service, which is more contemporary. Come in your jeans, come in shorts, come in tank tops. Uh, we don't care, just come. Uh, we also have a children's program during that hour, and we also have youth group. We also have a youth group on Wednesdays. So every Wednesday at six o'clock, you can send your uh, son or daughter, your teen, over. They can walk over, skateboard over, ride their bike over. We will feed them dinner and we will send them home to you in an hour and a half. It's a fun group and uh, they always love new people. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget this Halloween, October 31st, we're gonna have an open house. Uh, we're gonna have a uh, trunk or treat here and we're gonna be up and running for two hours. So please come by and get some candy, see and meet your neighbors. Let's have a fun and safe holiday. I'll see you guys next time, bye.